Welcome back. Today we have another video on Autogen. This is the advanced tutorial. We're going to go over a ton of different topics. I'm going to go in depth. I'm going to show you some code. I'm going to go through the documentation. And by the end of this video, you're going to be able to build incredible things with Autogen. And I realized while doing the research for this video, there's topics in Autogen that are expert level and warrant another video. So I'm going to be creating another video, an expert tutorial for the remaining topics topics that I don't cover in this video. But for this video, I'm covering almost everything in Autogen. And it turns out Autogen has a ton more functionality than I even realized when I first started playing with it. In fact, it is incredible as a drop-in replacement for your ChatGPT API, if you wanna use that. And stick around to the end of this video because we actually have a brand new agent type that we're gonna be talking about that was just released by the Autogen team. So let's go. All right, the first thing I wanna talk about is the LLM config and the config list parameters. And the config list parameter is something that's passed into the LLM config. First, let's start with LLM config. That is something that is passed to each agent. And it doesn't matter if you're creating an assistant agent or a user proxy agent, they all take LLM config. And there's a bunch of different settings that you can play around with for LLM config. So here's a few of them. The main thing that you're gonna be passing into the LLM config is the config list. And that's where you define which models that you wanna use and how to set up those models. And you can have a daisy chain of models that you want to use. So let's say you start with GPT-4, then you have an open source model, then you go to GPT-3.5, and it will actually fall back depending on if it gets an error or not. But you have some additional functionality that you can put in LLM config. So here's the first one, context. And if you're going to be using prompt templates, this is where you'll be defining the keys for that template. Now I'm just going to touch on prompt templates, and I'll probably save the actual deep dive into prompt templates for the expert tutorial. So here's an example. If your prompt is complete the following sentence and then this prefix, you can actually pass in the prefix just like that. So you say the prompt, here it is, then you pass in the context equals and then you pass in the keys. So prefix is today I feel. And then here it says the actual prompt will be complete the following sentence today I feel. So the context is where you can define different variables to insert into the prompt. So here it is problem. How many positive integers not exceeding 100 are multiples of two or three, but not four. And then the actual prompt is right here. And we insert the problem, which is defined in the context into the prompt. And then we end with solve the problem carefully. We can also say solve the problem step by step. And that just makes it super easy to create different prompt templates for different agents. So you're not rewriting the same thing over and over again. Next is a use cache flag. And that allows you to either use the cache or not. So by default, cache is enabled. So if you don't put anything, it's gonna be enabled. But if you don't wanna use the cache, such as if you're doing a lot of testing and you actually wanna see the replies back from ChatGPT or your open source model, then you would turn that to false. And it's true or false, it's a Boolean. And then, like I mentioned, config list. And this is a list of configurations for the completion to try. The first one that does not raise an error will be used. So that's where, as I mentioned, you put your daisy chain of large language models that you want to use and all the settings associated with them. But this is also where you're going to include your function definitions. And one of the most powerful features in Autogen is its ability to use function calling. And if you're not familiar with function calling, it's just a way for you to predefine functions for your Autogen or large language model to use. So so you can predefine functions in a certain format, and then you can actually write the functions in the code, and then the large language model can use those functions based on the definition and based on executing the code. Now, I'm going to get into function calling later in this video, so that's all I'm going to say about it now. But in the LLM config, that is where you're going to put all your function definitions. And here's another setting that's super useful, raise on rate limit or timeout. Now, I frequently get rate limit issues with ChatGPT. Now, obviously, you're not going to get this if you're running an open source model, but if you're using ChatGPT, either 3.5 or 4, you're going to get rate limit issues if you're using it too often. Typically, I'm getting a tokens per minute rate limit. And so what you can do here is you can set this to true or false. When it's true, 
it's actually going to raise an error and the code execution will stop. But if it's false, then negative one, it says right here, negative one will be returned when all configs fail. So it's going to go through the list of different LLMs that you've provided. And if all of them fail, it's not actually going to raise an error. It's just going to return negative one. And that allows you to include your own logic for what you want to happen if you run out of large language models to hit because you keep getting errors. And then another option you get is this config parameter. So, and this is specific to the open AI API and it allows you to pass in different parameters that are used with the OpenAI API. And then in addition to those, you also get these three, which are max retry period, which is the total time in seconds allowed for retrying failed requests. So if you don't want it to just continue retrying indefinitely, you can actually set a time limit on the retries, let's say 15 or 30 seconds. Then you have the retry wait time, and this is the time interval to wait in seconds before retrying a failed request. One thing that it would be nice is if you had an exponential back off, which I'm not sure you do because this is just a single integer. So this is like every three seconds you want to wait or every 10 seconds you want to wait before retrying again. Whereas it would be super nice if you can actually say, okay, one second, five seconds, 20 seconds, two minutes, six minutes. But I think at a certain point, it doesn't make sense to just continue waiting. And then you have the seed for the cache and the cache is super important. I'm going to touch on caching in a few minutes, but this allows you to set the seed value for a cache. So the cache is specific to that seed. I think by default, the example they give is 42. So if you run a prompt with the seed of 42 twice, you don't actually have to hit the OpenAI API a second time or whatever LLM you're using. It's just gonna use the cached version. If you change that to 41 or 47 or two, anything else, it's going to recache it. So that's an excellent way to control your budget and to control caching. And as I mentioned, you can pass in all the different values that you normally can with ChatGPT's API. So you have the model, the prompt, the messages, the max tokens, temperature, top P and stop, presence penality, frequency penality and best of. So you can pass all of those in. I'm not going to go over those because those aren't really specific to Autogen. All right, now let's talk about the config list. This is where you're going to define all of the large language models that you want to use, whether it's an open source model or a ChatGPT model. And you can do this in a number of ways. You can do this directly in the code, or you can have a separate JSON file that gets loaded into the config list. So if you're gonna be loading it in from a JSON file, you're gonna be using this right here, config list from JSON. And you're gonna call it OAI config list. You're gonna define the file location just like that. And you can either have it locally or if this is deployed to a production server, you just list the URL of where to find it. And then you have the filter dict right here. And the filter dict just tells Autogen which models to look for. And so here's what the OAI config list looks like. You don't need to have it as a separate file. You can literally just pass it directly in. But if you wanted to, this is what it looks like. So this is daisy chain. So it's going to try GPT-4 first with this API key. Then it's going to try GPT-4 again, except this time it's going to use the Azure OpenAI API key. And then last, it's going to try GPT-3.5 Turbo. And it only goes to the next one if the first one doesn't give a valid reply, such as if it fails or it times out. For each of them, you can include the model, the API key, your API base, which is the URL, the API type. So here it says Azure, but typically you're just gonna use the OpenAI API type, especially if you're using an open source model. You just wanna keep it standard with the OpenAI API type. And then you can have the API version right here. And by default, it uses the OpenAI API base. So if you did wanna use an open source model for the base, you would put the URL of the endpoint that you're using, whether it's a local server or you have it on something like RunPod, you would put it right there. Now I've already created two videos on how to get it set up locally and on RunPod. I'll link those in the description below so you know how. And let's put it all together. We have the LLM config, which gets passed into the assistant agent or the user proxy agent. And as one of the values, if we're keeping everything else as default, we just pass in the config list to the config list key. Now, of course, all the previous stuff I mentioned with LLM config, you can do that at the same time. And the nice thing is you can pass all of the LLM configs and thus the config list into each individual agent. So you can have different settings for every agent. And a good use for that is if you're running open source models. So let's say you have a really complex task that you're trying to set up. Let's say you have a team of agents and you have a coding agent, you have a creative writing agent, and then you also have one that needs to do function calling. and 
typically open source models are fine tuned to be good at like one thing. And with Autogen, that's actually a benefit. So you can actually choose the right model for the right task. You can choose the creative writing model for the creative writer. You can choose the coding model like Code Llama for the coder and so on. So here's some code. Let's actually see what this looks like. So we have two config lists here. We have the CL config list, which is Code Llama. So I specified our local model, Code Llama. I put in a fake API key. And then for the API base, let's say I have Code Llama spun up on a local server and it's port 3000. Then I can actually have a second server, Mistral config list, and we're going to be using Mistral 7b, another fake API key. And then here, I'm putting it on port 3001. So now I have two different models that are spun up running locally and I can actually assign them to different agents. So here we have our typical user proxy agent. And then for the coder agent, I'm passing in the config list is CL config list, which references this one right here, code llama. And then for the assistant agent of the product manager, I'm using Mistral. So I'm gonna pass in the Mistral config list and you can get as sophisticated as you want here. You can have a dozen different models, but of course you need to figure out how to run them locally and you need to have a powerful enough GPU to run all of them. And you can also mix and match between closed source and open source models. The possibilities are truly endless. All right, now let's talk about caching. Caching can be used both on the agent creation and definition side, as well as as the drop-in OpenAI replacement side. In the LLM config shown here, we have this parameter seed and we're gonna pass in the number 42. So let's talk about what this does for a minute. Now in the context of agents, this is how you use it. All you need to do is include this little seed parameter here in the LLM config. So you pass in the config list as normal and then you pass in seed. And what that's gonna do is look over here on the left, we have a dot cache folder followed by the number 42. And within that, we have a database, cache.db, and that saves the entire exchange based on the initial prompt. And so why would you need a cache? Well, the good thing is if you're running the same task over and over again for testing purposes, or even in production, if you have everything cached, you're gonna save both time and money because in the case of a closed source model like OpenAI, you don't actually have to hit that API endpoint again and again. If you're using the same prompt and the same C, then it'll just output the same exact output as it has cached. And in the case of an open source model where cost isn't as much of a factor, you're gonna save a lot of time because it doesn't actually need to run the inference against the prompts again because it already has it. Now, there's a few ways to clear the cache. Number one, very simple, right click on the dot cache directory and just click delete. You can also delete specific seeds. So you can right click on the 42 or whatever number you decide and you can delete it from there. And then the next time you run it, it's gonna recache it. Another way to do it is to simply change the seed value right here. So if we want to save that cache, but create a new cache, we can change it to 43. We can change it to one, two, three. We can change it to anything we want. And if it's a new seed and it has no reference to that seed, it's gonna recache everything and run it from scratch. And on the enhanced inference side, which we'll get to in a minute, which basically means Autogen can be used as a drop-in replacement for the OpenAI API, because it's essentially just a wrapper around that with a ton of additional tools and functionality that are very, very useful. You can use caching just the same. So if you execute the same exact prompt to ChatGPT, you won't actually need to hit the API endpoint a second time if the seed is the same and the prompt is the same. It works just the same as the agent side. And it also has these nice class methods. So if you're using this, you can use this set cache manually. So this allows you to set the cache with a seed, and then it also allows you to clear a cache. But of course, you can simply delete it manually as well, like I showed you. Now let's talk about enhanced inference. Now, Autogen really has two main parts to it. It has the multi-agent conversation framework, and that's really what it's known for, basically being able to define agents that work together to complete tasks. But it has this whole separate thing called enhanced inference, and I didn't even realize how powerful enhanced inference was until I started digging into it. And it truly is a major pillar of the Autogen framework. So let's read a little bit about it, and then I'm gonna talk about it. Enhanced inference. 
So autogen.completion is a drop-in replacement of the OpenAI completion and OpenAI chat completion for enhanced LLM inference. Basically what that means is if you're using the OpenAI API for completion, for inference, you can easily just use Autogen and get all of this additional functionality. And you don't even need to change your code if you already have a code base set up with OpenAI's API. So there are a number of benefits of using Autogen to perform inference. Performance tuning, API unit unification, caching, error handling, multi-config inference, result filtering, templating, and so on. It is really, really powerful. And I was thinking about this, why would they have done this? It seems to me like the main functionality for Autogen is the multi-agent framework. But as I was thinking about that, to make that multi-agent framework super powerful, actually having all of this additional functionality on the OpenAI API endpoint is really powerful for the agents. And they probably built it and said, oh, look at all this functionality. We should just also package this up as part of Autogen. So I think that's what happened. I don't actually know. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about within enhanced inference is the performance tuning. And that basically means finding the best settings for the large language model that you're using. And so here it says the tunable hyperparameters and include the model, the prompt, the max number of tokens, the temperature, top P, N, stop, presence, penality, frequency, penality, and best of. So it will automatically adjust all of these settings depending on what your goal is and depending on what the evaluation method is. And so here it explains it really well. The cost of using foundation models for text generation is typically measured in terms of the number of tokens. Yeah, so we knew that. From the perspective of an application builder using foundation models, so a developer, the use case is to maximize the utility of the generated text under an inference budget constraint, measured in the number of dollars to solve the task successfully. So let's say you have a task to to create a piece of code that outputs something. You can actually provide an evaluation method that tests whether the output is correct based on that code. And then you can tune all of these different settings to figure out, okay, based on what I'm tuning, what is the lowest dollar value that I can actually get this task completed within. And so there are five pieces of information that tuning can be performed on. The validation data, the evaluation function, the metric to optimize the search space, and the budget. And we're going to talk about all five of those. First, the validation data. This is basically a set of data that shows what a successful performance looks like. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into performance tuning because this is really complex stuff. And I'm going to save that for the expert video. And to be honest, I'm still wrapping my head around it. So after the validation data, we're going to have the evaluation function. And this is a function that's defined by you that evaluates whether the output is successful or not. So here we have a evaluate math responses and we have the answer from the LLM and then we say return success and then we have this evaluation function is equivalent and we pass in the answer and the actual solution and then we compare them against each other and if the answer that the large language model gave us and the answer we know to be correct is equal then we pass back success. And what that'll do is once we pass it back, it informs the enhanced inference that that set of variables was successful within that budget. Then we have the metric to optimize. And it says here, the metric to optimize is usually an aggregated metric over all the tuning data instances. For example, users can specify success as the metric and max as the optimization mode. By default, the aggregation function is taking the average. And then we have the search space. So basically, which parameters do we want to test against. So we can test against the model, the prompts, the max tokens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we give it a budget. And the budget is going to be in dollars. So it's going to try to find the successful combination of different parameters to get the correct output, but to do so within a given budget. And again, the budget is in dollars and it's dollars per 1000 tokens. And here's what the actual completed code looks like. So we have a config and analysis autogen.completion.tune. So we have our tuning data. We have our metric of success. That's what we're measuring against. We want to maximize it. And then we have our evaluation function. We have our inference budget of five cents. So five cents per 1000 tokens. We have our optimization budget of $3 and then the number of samples. And we can sample a fixed number, but if it's negative one, it's gonna be unlimited, it'll test everything. So another really good thing for enhanced inference is that you can use one API endpoint now and get a bunch of different models.
models. And that also includes local models. So with this one endpoint, we can use Text DaVinci 003, GPT 3.5 Turbo, and GPT 4. And we can also use local LLMs. They suggest using Fast Chat. I used LM Studio and RunPod using Test Generation Web UI. Again, videos will be in the description below. And just like we did on the agent side, we can have a daisy chain of models to use. And when one fails, we go on to the next one. Or we can even specify different models for different types of agents. And we don't need to change the actual API code at all. That's why it's super powerful for API unification. Another thing that we can do with enhanced inference is templating. And templating just allows us to write less code and more prompts so when would we actually use templating? Why would we actually use it? Well, one example is if you've ever watched any of my LLM testing videos, you notice that in a lot of the prompts I put at the end, explain your reasoning step by step. And what I found is when I put that, I get better answers from the large language model. And so rather than having to put explain your reasoning step-by-step step at the end of every prompt in Autogen, we can just create a template from that. And we can have the problem, we can actually have the task that we wanna execute, and then we'll add in explain your reasoning step-by-step step at the end of that. So here's an example of how that would work. Here's the context, and this is the problem we're looking to solve. So how many positive integers not exceeding 100 are multiples of two or three, but not four. Now in the prompt, we pass in that problem right here, and then we add solve the problem carefully. Rather than solve the problem carefully, that's where we would actually put explain your reasoning step by step. I think effectively they're trying to do the same thing, but that's what I use is explain your reasoning step by step. And then you wanna add this allow format string template equals true to make sure that it gets inserted properly. So that is really, really powerful and I encourage you to play around with templating. And then last we have logging. It does say logging is experimental, but it seems to work just fine. So when you have your instance of Autogen, you just do Autogen, chat completion, start logging, and then you can do all your inference calls like normal. And then at the end, you can actually get the logged history and look through exactly what happened with all of the API calls, which is nice for debugging. Okay. Our next topic is RAG agents. That's retrieval augmented generation. That means that you have some external data source, typically in the form of embeddings, and our agents are actually able to pull knowledge, pull information from those sources. And this makes them incredibly powerful. And based on our initial two types of agents, we have our assistant agent and user proxy agent. We just add retrieve to the beginning of those to make them retrieval augmented agents. So retrieve assistant agent and retrieve user proxy agent. So let's look at an example from the documentation. We have our normal assistant agent right here, and then we have our retrieve user proxy agent right here. So we're giving our user proxy agent the power of RAG. And we pass in this retrieve config parameter that takes the task type. So here's QA, which is question answer. And then we have our docs path. And here it's passing in this readme file. So now this user proxy agent has access to the information contained within this file. And by default, it chunks everything for us. It converts it to embeddings. It stores it in a vector database all by default, all automatically. And of course, we have full control over all of these settings. Let's continue with this example though. So we have the rag proxy agent and we're gonna initiate chat and what is Autogen? Now here's the output. Autogen is a framework that enables the development of large language model applications using multiple agents that can converse with each other. So exactly what we would expect because it has access to that documentation. Now we're gonna create a regular user proxy agent. It's not gonna have access to that information and we're gonna see the difference in responses. So here the output is in computer software, Autogen is a tool that generates program code automatically without the need for manual coding. It is commonly used in fields as software engineering, blah, blah, blah. So basically, not the right answer because it has no notion of what Autogen is in the original large language model knowledge set. And so now you can give specific agents a ton of additional information that it doesn't have in its initial data set. So 
let's talk about customizing retrieval agents. So customizing embedding function. By default, sentence transformers and its pre-trained models will be used to compute the embedding. And quickly, the embeddings are just taking text and converting them to vector format that allows relevant search to be really easily done. But you can easily customize the embeddings function. You can use a different model, a local model. You can use ChatGPT's embedding functions. You can use anything you want. So here's an example from OpenAI. We have our embedding functions defined in this object right here. Then we pass in that OpenAI underscore EF right there in our embedding function. So everything goes within this retrieve config. We still pass it the task, the docs path, and the embedding function is something new. Right here, we can see we're using hugging face the same way. So if we don't want to use OpenAI, we can use hugging face. And you can also customize the text split function. And the text split function is basically our chunking method. And I usually don't change this, but you can if you want to. So in this example, Langchain has a text splitter and we can use all the different text splitters in Langchain. So we can just define it and then pass it into this custom text split function. So then when it actually goes to execute, it's going to execute the text splitting through this function right here defined here. We can also customize our vector database. By default, it uses Chroma DB, but you can use Pinecone. You could use anything else that you want. And in this example, they're using Qdrint. So same thing. We define Qdrint as a client, and then we rewrite our query vector database method. This is all just custom code if we wanted to write that ourselves. But then at the bottom, in this retrieve docs method, that's actually overwriting the default retrieve docs method. And that's how you can customize which vector database you use. And again, going really deep into this, I'll probably save for the expert tutorial. But now you kind of get the gist of how this all works. You can customize absolutely everything. And here's a sophisticated example, integrating retrieval agents with other agents in a group chat. So like normal, we have the LLM config and here we define functions. I'll touch on that in a minute. Everything else stays the same. We have the boss who's a normal user proxy agent. And then we have the retrieve user proxy agent. So this is a user proxy agent that also has the ability to gather information from external data sources. And we want code execution to be false because we just want them to pull information and we want the user proxy agent, the standard one, to be doing the code execution. And we pass in the retrieve config. Then we have the assistant agent, another assistant agent, and another assistant agent. And this is gonna be a coding team. And so we can have certain agents that are retrieval, certain agents that are not, and they're all working together. And the the way we actually kick it off is with the boss and the boss is the standard agent. And there we go. Okay, so we talked about a few different types of agents so far. We talked about the conversible agent, which includes the assistant agent and the user proxy agent. We also talked about rag agents, which have the ability to pull information from documents. And now, as of a few days ago, we have a brand new agent type called the teachable agent. And the teachable agent, you're actually able to give it information that it learns, stores in long-term storage, and has even after the chat conversation ends. So typically, if you're giving information to an agent, it doesn't have that information once that task is completed or once that chat is closed. But now with the teachable agent, we can always call the teachable agent, which will have that information forever. And so we define a teachable agent in the same way we define our other types of agents. So right here, just like that. But rather than saying user proxy agent or assistant agent, we use teachable agent. And we have this teach config. And for the teach each config, we have a few parameters. We have the verbosity, which is optional, and we have zero for passing in basic information, one to add memory operations, and two for analyzer messages, and three for memo lists. We have reset db so if we put true it's going to use a new database every single time and of course if we actually wanted to learn something over time we set that to false or just leave it blank then we have our path to the db directory again another optional parameter this is a path to the directory where the database is stored the nice thing is autogen creates the database for us we don't need to worry about it we can also pre-populate the database with information so we don't actually need to go through the agent interface a conversation to give it additional information 
information so we could do that here and then we have the recall threshold which is the maximum distance for retrieved memos where 0.0 is exact match and larger values allow for more memories to be retrieved and then we have the max number of retrievals all of these are optional so let's look at an actual example because I know this is a little confusing so back here we have our teachable agent we're passing it our teach config our teach config here verbosity zero we're just passing it basic information we are going to reset the database so it's going to start from scratch here's the path to the database right there and then we have our recall threshold this is the default value anyways but higher numbers allow for more but less relevant memos to be recalled now let's teach it new facts so here we say what is the Vicuña model? And we initiate the chat and it says, I'm sorry, but I don't have information because we haven't taught it anything. Then next, we do the same thing. We initiate the chat, but we actually tell it what it is. Vicuña is a 13B parameter language model released by Meta. And now we set clear history to false, although that is the default, I believe. And now when we ask it the same question, it says, thank you for providing that information. The Vicuña model is a large scale language model developed by Meta and a bunch of other information. Same thing here, what is the Orca model? And then here it tries to guess what the Orca model is based on knowing what the Vicuña model is, but it's not really an accurate answer. The Orca model is a yet to be released language model by Meta, referring to the research preview API release of Meta's advanced language model. I don't have specific details, etc. But now, we're actually gonna tell it. Orca is a 13B parameter language model released by Microsoft. It outperforms Vicuña on most tasks. Now, it has that information. And so let's see it again. Now let's start with a new chat by clearing the previous chat's history. At this point, common LLM-based assistants would forget everything, but the teachable agent can retrieve memories from the vector database as necessary. So here we go. How does the Vicuña model compare to the Orca model? So we have no chat history, but what it can do is it can pull from its vector database of memories. And here we go. It actually gives us a legitimate, correct answer. Amazing. And you can not only pass it memories, but you can actually have it learn your preferences. And here we can actually call something interesting, learn from user feedback. So as the user is giving feedback to the model, and let's say you have the feedback set to always, every single iteration, it's gonna ask you for feedback. Here it can actually learn from your feedback and store only the relevant memos. So let's say you prefer short answers or you prefer very verbose answers. You can teach it to the teachable agent and and the teachable agent will work with the user proxy agent, will work with the assistant agent to make sure you're getting the responses that you want. So here's an example. Please summarize this abstract. So we have the abstract right here, and here's the teachable agent's output, which is just unstructured information. So then it says, when I'm summarizing an abstract, I try to make the summary contain just three short bullet points. And here it says, okay, thank you. And then the teachable agent now says title, innovation, and key empirical results. And that is the format that we asked it to provide in. So the teachable agent is brand new. I'm still learning more about it and I'm gonna include more information in that expert tutorial. And I know this is a long video, there's a lot to cover and I really probably didn't dive deep enough into any of these topics. So let me know in the comments if you want me to expand on any of these topics in the expert tutorial that I'm gonna create. So code execution and Docker. Docker by default is turned on, but you also have to have it installed. And the way to do that is very simple. You need to do pip install Docker like normal to make sure you have the Docker library installed. And as I mentioned, Docker is enabled by default. And if you don't have Docker installed, even if you have Docker enabled, Autogen is smart enough to fall back and it says, hey, we looked for Docker, it's not there, so we're gonna execute the code without Docker. Now, right here, it says, we strongly recommend using Docker to execute code. Now, there's a reason for that. You're having artificial intelligence write code and execute code on your local machine in most cases. So, of course, you want to Docker that and have it in an enclosed environment just in case, right? And there's two ways to do it. You can either run the entire Autogen project from within a Docker image, which is typically how I do it, or you can run it outside of Docker and then only have the code execution work within Docker. And they show how to do that here. So enable Python 3 Docker image. And here in the code execution config, we have our work directory. So that's where all the code gets output or any output gets stored. And then we have this use Docker Python colon three. And that's it, that's Docker. And I do recommend just like they do, use Docker as much as possible. Okay, there's actually two more things that I wanna show you today. 
The first thing is function calling. One of the most powerful pieces of functionality for any large language model is function calling. And basically what function calling is, is you have a definition of a bunch of different functions that you might want the large language model to be able to use and execute. And then you can actually define what those functions look like. So let me show you an example. So here, as mentioned in the LLM config, you're gonna have a functions key. Within the functions key, you're going to define what the functions look like. And in this example, we have two. We have one called Python and one called sh. So we have the name, description, parameters that are gonna be passed into this function. And we have that for both. So you're basically setting up what the actual function is going to look like. Then down here, we define the functions in our actual code, not in Autogen. We define our functions according to the function description. So we have exec, Python, we pass in cell just like we just defined. We have our actual code and same thing with exec at h. And so what this allows us to do is build a ton of additional functionality for our agents. We can really define any function to give them additional powers. Then we have to actually register the function. So here, when we say user proxy, we're gonna register function. We're gonna pass in a function map. We have Python and sh, which refer to the different names right here, Python and sh in our functions LLM config. And then we pass in the actual function name. So exec Python and exec sh. And those are the ones that are actually written and defined right there. And then we can actually use it. So we have user proxy initiate chat like normal, chatbot, and the message, draw two agents chatting with each other with an example dialog. Don't add plt.show. And the chatbot to the user proxy says, suggested function call Python. And so now it knows how to put together a function call to that Python function. Now, function calls can get extremely complicated and I'm not gonna go too far into it. I'm probably gonna do a much deeper dive in the expert tutorial. So here's one more example of function calling. We're gonna be calling the Wolfram Alpha API. So we define find the function here, query Wolfram. We put a description, we talk about the parameters that we're gonna be passing in and the required parameter called query. Here we have the function map, query Wolfram, math user proxy agent. So this is actually from the Wolfram Alpha API. And then we start the conversation. So problem, find all that satisfy the inequality. And then we pass in a math function, express your answer in interval notation. And so we already have this execute one Wolfram query as part of the math user proxy agent that we're pulling in. And that's something predefined in Autogen. So let's see what it actually outputs. Problem, here's the problem. Then it's suggested function call. So it realizes, okay, I need to use query Wolfram. It passes in the required query parameter. Here it is. And then it actually calls it. And then we get the output. So it is beautiful. It works flawlessly. Okay, the last thing I wanna show, and this is not necessarily something that's built into Autogen. Autogen just happens to be really capable with learning new tools. And that is exactly what we're gonna be looking at. Teaching the agents to use new tools. In this example, we set up everything like normal. We have a standard, assistant agent, a standard user proxy agent. And our task is to find archive papers that show how are people studying trust calibration in AI-based systems. So it does that, no problem, writes the code, queries archive, gets the answers. Then we give it some feedback and we have task two, analyze the above results to list the application domains. Okay, writes more code does that. Then we say, use this data to generate a bar chart. So we give it a bunch of tasks in a row and it creates Python methods to execute that. It fails at some times. The user proxy agent gives it feedback and it fixes the code. But here's where the special part comes. Right here, task four, reflect on the sequence and create a recipe containing all the steps necessary and name for it. So basically what it's saying is find exactly what worked in the previous few steps and redefine it remove anything that didn't work and put it all in a single file. And now that's what we have right here. And then going forward, what we actually do is we actually put that entire recipe in the task itself. But we don't just have to do that. 
Now with the teachable agent, we can actually give it the recipe to store. We don't actually have to include it in the task definition itself. And we can also store it in a database. We can store it in a local file and just tell any other agent how to pull from that file. So it's extremely, extremely powerful. Okay, that's it for today. This was an extremely long video, but hopefully you learned enough where now you can consider yourself an advanced Autogen user. If you liked this video and you want to get notified about the expert tutorial, be sure to like my video, be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.